morning, River Rock Church. Thank you so much for joining us on this, uh, I believe, what may turn into a snowy day. So glad you guys all came out before anything, uh, any ailments settled in. But thank you guys so much. We're going to celebrate Jesus. We're going to celebrate God's goodness. So why don't you take a moment, greet a few more folks around you, and we'll jump into worship like we always do. I count on one thing The same God that never fails Will not fail me now You won't fail me now In the waiting The same God who's never late Is working all things out He's working all things out Yes, I will Lift you high in the lowest valley, yes, I will bless your name, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days, oh, yes, I will, hey, sing it again, I count on one. Never runs out. 
doesn't he? Amen. Amen. Let's never forget that. Hallelujah. Well, thank you guys so much for worshiping with us, and it's, it's going to be an awesome day. And so we've had a few more friends join us, so why don't you take just a few more minutes, because we're a friendly church. Greet a few more folks. Make sure they feel welcome today. Good morning. Good morning. Amen. Happy Sunday, everybody. Happy Sunday, Happy Sunday, and it's snowing. Yes. That is not something to cheer about. <laughs> anyway, everyone, welcome to our Sunday service this morning. We are happy to have each and every one of you. Do we have any first-time guests with us this morning? You can lift your hands for me. No one, we're all still family. Praise Jesus. Amen. All right, so guys, we have baby dedication on November the 15th, both services. So if you do have a baby that needs to be dedicated, you can sign up in front at the lobby. On Saturday from 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m., the Cultural Impact Team will be hosting a time of prayer for our country, for the elections and everything. So guys, if you are interested, I know most of you have been praying, you know, alone or by yourselves at home. But this is a time for us to come together and pray as one body. Amen? Amen. Amen. Remember, we do have the bread ministry. It's in our fellowship room at the back. If you go out these doors, it's to your right and then a left. 
and you enter into our fellowship room, we do have food stuff there that you can take. If somebody needs something, please take it. If you know someone in need, please do so as well. Our last one found is found at the front lobby. If you lost something, you can go to the front desk. You can ask for it. If it's not there or if you need to search some more, you can go to the fellowship room. And next Sunday is the first Sunday of November. So it is Fellowship Sunday. Amen. So if you're coming to the first service, we would have breakfast provided for you. If you're coming to the second service, we will have pizza provided for you after service. And our pastor is very happy about that. So for the first service, we try to have breakfast at 8 a.m. Because service starts at 8.30. So if you want to come a little bit earlier on Sunday, next Sunday, please feel free to do so. And we do have a praise report. And praise reports talks about the goodness of God. Amen? Amen. 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 So young lady said she asked a prayer for her two grown sons who both ended up in the hospital with heart issues, Mark and Chris. Doctors could not find anything wrong with them after she was prayed for. Amen? Amen. So our God is a good God. And guys, if you do have a testimony, you came up for prayer after service or before service, please fill one of these out and let us know how we can glorify God together with each other and also encourage each other. Amen? Amen. God bless you and welcome our pastor. Praise the Lord. Well, it's good to be back. Um, two Thursdays ago in the morning, I started not feeling well. And so it progressed over the weekend. I think it's just um, temperature change, seasonal. Um, so Greg was good to come in. Uh, Greg was a great message, right? Yeah. So I appreciate Greg coming in. So I am much better, um, but just in case... Um, there's anything lingering, I'm, I'm uh, just for this Sunday acting like a super duper, coming through the green room, going back to the green room, and avoiding contact. Uh, it's not where my heart wants to be, but for today, probably the best. And then we'll be back to normal next week. Praise God. All right, so um, we have an election coming up. Raise your hand if you voted. Okay, raise your hand if you're going to vote. Okay. All right. Praise God. And so I would encourage you to fill those ballots out. Vote the word of God. If you have a question where to line up, how about life? What, what candidate wants, wants uh, newborns to live and which ones are in favor of them being killed? That's a great way just to start right there. So if you don't know what, which one is, um, check with the the welcome booth. I'm sure there's information there. You can go online, figure that out. So praise God. We like traditional marriage between man and a woman. Praise God. Simple things like that. So just check it up. Vote the Bible. See, the, a disciple votes the Word of God. A disciple lives according to the Word of God. That's why the world does not like disciples. They don't mind converts. Converts doesn't automatically govern their life by the word of God. A disciple governs their life by the word of God, and the word of God never changes. That's why they don't like you, because you don't change. And so if you just look the last 20, 25 years, how morals have changed and how positions have changed, what what's, was not popular 50 years ago, what's popular today, it changes because the world is that way. But a, a Christian that believes the Word of God, the Word of God reads the same today, yesterday, and forever. And so tell someone you, change, you ch- never change. Amen. Praise God. All right. So, um, so go out and vote. I would encourage you to drop the ballot by a polling place or a ballot box, then not mailing it. I would encourage you that, to do that. Praise the Lord. Okay. Are you guys ready for the Word? Yes. Okay. Well, today, I'm a special day today. I'm, I'm celebrating 25 years of teaching ministry today. Praise God. So, um, started October in 1995, teaching the Word of God. And so, it's 25 years. So, praise the Lord. 
And the Lord was, has been to every one of them I've ever spoken at. So thank you, Lord, for being faithful. Holy Spirit has helped me in most of them. Hallelujah, that I've looked for them. So, okay, well, let's, let's, uh, let's read the Word of God. Romans 8, 7, we're going to read through verse 13. It says, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. <clears throat> but if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, and the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. But if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the Word of God today that's blessed, and we're going to open our heart up and be blessed by it. Holy Spirit, we call upon you as the divine teacher. You would anoint, anoint the eyes, ears, and heart of each person listening and open them by the gift of your grace and cause them to see, hear, and understand what you have with them today. Break it apart and minister it to them. We thank you for doing this miracle, and only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, let's, uh, let's do a recap on two weeks ago. Um, some of the principles shared is so important that we understand and have those grounded in our life. So let's just do a little recap since you slept since the last time we talked. <clears throat> well, most of you have, praise God. So um, Romans chapter 7, Paul's testimony, Paul leaves in, in verse 14 all the way to the end of the chapter, Paul leaves uh, 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 an 11-verse testimony of his life as a young Christian. He was saved by grace but still had a law mentality. And so he realizes Jesus got him saved and he received Jesus by faith, but then tried to live the Christian life in his own energy and his own strength by the law. And we're going to find out he tried to live by willpower. And so I'm glad Paul left his personal testimony because he left many clues to what his problem was. And so as we read through there, I asked you to read or count how many times he said the word I. And I think it was 26 times Paul used the word I, 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 I. And he used the, wi the word will or wills seven times. And so he gave a complete go of it according to willpower, trying to live the Christian life and overcome the flesh by willpower. And Paul just kept going around the same mountain over and over and over again, trying to get a different result. And what's that called? Insanity. It's called insanity. And so trying to live the Christian life by your own willpower and your own energy is insane. So stop it. So Paul called himself carnal. Only a believer is called carnal. And so the Corinthians were called carnal. An unbeliever is called the natural man. And so, uh, so Paul called himself carnal. And so he's trying to live the Christian life in his own strength. And we find out that uh, he left many clues that he had eye disease. And so he didn't have physical eye disease. He had the letter I. He had his eyes on himself. He was a navel gazer. So he was always looking to himself. He was trying to do everything he needed to do, stop the things he wanted to stop, and he couldn't find any victory. And finally he gave up. And he asked a wonderful question, an anointed question, that each one of us need to ask. And so he, he finally gave up on himself and looked away from himself. And he looked up for the first time in many, many months. Because until that time, he was looking at himself. And his questions were similar to this. What new thing must I do to overcome this? What new thing must I start to overcome this? What must I stop to become a godly person? And so the questions were what, what, what? And the word I was always in it. But then Paul finally, for the last time, tried and tried and tried and gave up on himself. And Paul's worst day was his best day and he didn't realize it. And he finally looked up away from himself and he asked a question that started with the word who. Not what, who. Who will deliver me from the body of this death? And his answer was found when he caught a glimpse of the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ at the right hand of God. 
And it says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. And so just a few words was his answer, 11 verses talking about the frustration of trying to live as a carnal Christian, his answer. And then in verse 1, the first thing we find out he gets free from when he gets his eyes off himself was free from condemnation. Romans 8, 1 says, therefore we are now, say now, now. We, are, uh, we are now, um, says there's therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. And so condemnation is the pit that navel gazers are destined to fall into. If you're focusing on yourself and your performance, you're going to end up under condemnation and guilt. The ministry of the law is a ministration of condemnation. And so when Paul got his eyes off himself, got his eyes on this high priest representing him to God in perfection, got his eyes on the blood of Jesus that is on the mercy seat of heaven, crying out better things than that of Abel, that's when he got free from condemnation. And you'll get free from condemnation. If you're under guilt and condemnation in your life right now, your eyes are on you. You're a navel gazer. I'm sorry to tell you that. But there's an answer to that. You can be a sun gazer. Tell someone, be a sun gazer, not a navel gazer. Hallelujah. Stay out of the navel. It's a dark place. Verse 2 talks about that in every Christian, there's two laws operating. Right now in you, there's two laws operating. One's stronger than the other. One is more powerful than the other. One is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That's operating in your born-again spirit right now. The other law is operating in your flesh. It's called the law of sin and death. Now, both of them are operating. One will overcome the other if you tap into it. The law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is a law that will cause you to overcome the law of sin and death if you operate in it. Just like the laws of thrust and lift, you can overcome gravity and fly. And so the same thing, if you'll operate in the spirit of life in Christ, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Then verse 3 says what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and on account of sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. What's the demarcation of the New Testament? The demarcation of the New Testament is what we could not do under the law. God did say God did. And so are you living in the done of Jesus Christ? Jesus on the cross cried out, I'm still trying. No. Oh, I'm sorry. Clueless translation. Jesus said, it is finished. So are you living in the done? Or are you still in the doo-doo? <laughs> Blame it on the... Fuzziness of my mind, I'm sorry. <laughs> Joanne will tell me what was appropriate afterwards. <clears throat> Romans 8, 4. It says that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Here we find that there's a righteous requirement of the law. What's that? The righteous requirement of the law is love. The law required you to love God with all your heart, your mind, your mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Same requirements in the new covenant, to love God and to love others. But how you accomplish it is different. In the old covenant, you accomplished it by your self-effort, by the strength of the flesh, by your own ability. And have you ever tried to love someone in your own ability? And all you wanted to do is slap them. <laughs> and so praise God. But if you'll tap into the law of life in Christ Jesus and tap into the love of God that's been shed abroad in your heart, not your love, it's God's love, it's supernatural. If you tap into that, then you can walk in supernatural love and that love will be genuine and not fake. And so the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Notice that the Christian life is fulfilled in us, not by us. It's something that's done on the inside of us. It's a miracle that takes place. It's called the vine and the branch relationship. Jesus is the vine. We are the branch. 
If we abide in him and he abides in us, we will bear much fruit. But apart from him, we can do nothing. And so, you know, I, I've said this before, but before you can enter the in him truths, what are the in him truths? In him, I have all things. In him, I can do all things. In him, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. But before you can enter the in him truths, you must first fully embrace the in yourself truths. And what are the in yourself truths? In yourself, you are nothing. Paul says that, that uh, I outworked all the apostles, yet I am nothing in myself. You have nothing. Paul says, what did you receive that you, what do you have that you have not received? So in ourselves, we came with a blank slate. We came naked into the world. We, we didn't have anything. Everything you have was a gift from God. And so you were not a self-made man or self-made woman. So, so you changed your diaper. You educated yourself. You gave yourself intellect. You gave yourself the, the open doors of your life and the people that's come along and helped you out. No one did that, did they? You, you, you were just an island to yourself. No one ever helped you or, or did anything for you. And so you have nothing apart from Christ and you can do nothing because you're in, because you're in yourself. And so you need, to, you need to grasp that. So how do you know that you, you, you haven't, you're trying to enter the in him truths without first embracing the in yourself truths? You leave Jesus out of it. I'm the righteousness of God. You lie, you fry. <laughs> oh, I am, Pat. I'm the righteousness of God. No, you're not. You're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I can do all things. No, you can't. Well, I can. It says that. No, well, quote the whole thing. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How do you know that you're a carnal believer trying to operate in the in him truths is when you leave Jesus out of it? And then verse 5 is a def is the definition of walking in the spirit. Because verse 4, Paul's the first time Paul brings out walking according to the Spirit is found in the New Testament. Most people start talking about walking in the Spirit or according to the Spirit, and they'll start in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Walk in the Spirit, you not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And so almost everybody that talks about walking in the Spirit starts there because it mentions that by name there, but the first mention of it is not in Galatians. It's actually in the book of Romans. And Paul gives a definition of it in verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh, set their minds. Say, set their minds. Set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, set their minds. Say, set their mind on the things of the Spirit. So what's the definition in the New Testament of walking in the Spirit? It means to set your mind on the things of the Spirit. Well, Pastor, that helps me a little bit, but what are the things of the Spirit? The things of the Spirit are what's true in the Spirit realm. It's what's true in the Spirit realm. Well, what's true in the Spirit realm? Well, there's angels in the Spirit realm. I brought mine. Hallelujah. There's demons. None of them came in today. They don't like River Rock Church. So pick them up on the way out if you have any. <laughs> No, praise God, don't, don't pick them up. Leave them up. Leave them out in the cold. Your born-again spirit is in the spirit realm. Whatever's true about your born-again spirit, that is one of the things in the spirit. But how do you know what's true about your spirit? You have to have it by revelation to the word. You can't detect your, what's in your spirit by your five senses. Then also, who else is in the spirit realm? It's the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ at the right hand of the Father. We're going to find out later in Colossians, that's exactly where we're to set our focus. We're to set our mind above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. I can't explain it, but when you get your eyes on the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ through the mirror of God's word and see him as he is, power and life flows from him through the Holy Spirit up through your spirit, and it will dominate your natural. <coughs> Uh, 
And so verse 6 goes on to tell us what are the signs or the fruit that you're walking in the Spirit. How do you know you're walking in the Spirit or the flesh? And so Paul brings out the fruit of each. Verse 6 says, for to be carnally minded, that means to be set your mind on the things of the earth or yourself. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Every time you have been walking in the Spirit, you've had life and peace. Every time that you've walked in the flesh, you've experienced some form of death. Bitterness, anger, resentment, worry, frustration, all forms of death. And there's not a single time that you've been in fear and worry and depression and anger that you've had, that there's not a single time you had your mind on the Lord, on the mind and the things in the spirit, and you've experienced those things. It's impossible. And so, so Paul talked about it. If you're not filled with life and peace, you, know, you need to know something that your focus is on yourself. You're a navel gazer. And so we talked about spiritual light and spiritual darkness. And if how we dealt with spiritual darkness is how most people deal, I mean, if most people deal with natural darkness like they did with spiritual darkness, it would be a strange thing to behold. If we were in a dark room in here and we tried to deal with the dark room, like most Christians do spiritually with spiritual darkness, that one would say, okay, well, let's bind it. Well, I bind you darkness. Well, okay, how about I loose you light? How about, let's fast and pray. Let's fast and make this go away. And all you're doing is you're hungry in the dark. You have a grumbling stomach and it's still dark. Well, let's do a Jericho march. Let's pray about this and do a Jericho march and you're stumbling all over the chairs. No, the answer is flip on the light switch. Operate in a higher law than darkness. Electricity and light is a higher law than darkness. And, but you, it's an act of your will. You have to flip the switch. Now, God is so good as he left in you a light switch. And it can be turned on or turned off. It's either off or on right now. And so where's this light switch? It's your mind. And so right here, your light switch is off. When your eyes are on yourself, on the natural, on the earthly things, you're carnal. But your light switch can be turned on and you're focusing on what's true in the spirit realm. You're focusing on Jesus, what's true in the spirit realm. Do you have a picture of the light switch? The light switch. True decision. Now this worked really wonderfully here in the United States. But I went to Australia, and I was teaching on walking in the Spirit in Australia. And actually over there, it's opposite. So when you turn it off, it's on, and turn it up, it's off, and you're like, well, that really hurts my illustration. <laughs> so praise God, we're, we're up right side up here. <laughs> That's your mind at any one time. Is it on? Is it up? Is it focusing on the things of the Spirit, or is it off? There's no, no uh, middle, middle ground there. And so if it's on, then you're operating in the, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. When you're focusing on the things of the Spirit, what's true of the Spirit is tapped into. And that law that's operating right now in, the, in your spirit man will start flowing into your soul and impact your body and your natural circumstances. It's a law. And you operate in the, <coughs> most of you operate in that law at church. During our worship service, you are just zoned in and you're just focusing on Jesus. You're not, mine's not off on lunch or anything, but you're focusing on Jesus. You've entered in and you're just, you're just experiencing life and peace and joy and you're filled with the glory of God. Then pastor gets up and talks about the righteousness of Christ and and who you are in Christ, and who you are in your new born again spirit, and you're forgiven totally, 100%, and, and you're a priest, and you're holy, and all this other stuff. And, 
and then you have another thing of worship, and you're so oh, now you got a you, you got a glory sandwich going on. But then you walk out the door and you pull that, that bag of worries that you dropped at the door, you put it back on your shoulder. You start thinking about your work and your family and your kids and brother bucket or sister bucket mouth or brother flip a lip says something on the way out. Monday, you're totally focusing on your job and all the stuff. And you wonder where all the joy go. Well, during that hour or two hours, you're operating under a spiritual law. And then, but you flipped off the switch afterwards and you're still operating under a spiritual law. But now you're being controlled by the law of sin and death. And so what's the answer? Keep your switch flipped. And verse, uh, verse um, 6 goes on to tell you that if you're carnally minded, you're dead. So show the picture of the person with their, their, their light switches flipped off. Oh. There's a guy, Monday mornings hit him. (laughs) Finances. Relationship problem. He has no date. It's been a while since he's had a date. It's because he's so ugly. (laughs) That's what you're thinking, you know, like. Yeah, I thought I'd be promoted by now. And... <sighs> or you can be spiritually minded, be filled with life and peace. What's the next one? Yeah, there's a guy. He's focusing on, he has the blessing of Abraham on him. He's forgiven. God's for him, not against him. He hasn't seen everything yet, but God's moving, God's acting. He's going, he's... He's, he's healed, he's whole, he's wealthy, healthy, wise, and good looking. <laughs> See, I'm healthy, I'm wealthy, I'm wise, and good looking. Amen. Flip your switch. <clears throat> Verse 7 says, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it's not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. What's the carnal mind? To be carnally minded is death. To be carnally minded means that you are, your mindset is on yourself perpetually. It's all about you. The unholy trinity, me, myself, and I. Now you may, how do you know you're selfish? If you're selfish, you'll know you're selfish if you go to a football game and when they huddle up, you think they're talking about you. you might be a little self-centered. <laughs> You'll be amazed, you know, the question, I wonder what people think about me. You'll be amazed at how much people don't think about you. <laughs> you know what? You know, you know what you need probably more than anything right now is to be out of your mind. <laughs> Ask someone, are you out of your mind? Do you know that that's the biggest part of the curse is self-centeredness? Do you know before in the Garden of Eden, they were naked and didn't know it? No, well, no, pa- no pa- uh, p- pastor. They were fil- They had the glory cloud around them. Really? What verse is that? It said they were naked and not ashamed. Why would they even have to mention naked and not ashamed if they had a glory cloud around them? They were naked, streaking. (laughs) And didn't know it. Why? They were so God conscious. So spirit conscious. And when the fall happened, (laughs) (laughs) 
and then they put salad dressing on. <laughs> and then it was so tough for Eve, is this, bre- is this lunch or is this laundry? <laughs> so tough. Life becomes so complicated after sin enters in. Praise God. <clears throat> the carnal mind is one that's on itself perpetually. The mind of the flesh is set upon the natural only. In its enmity against God, it means hostility. Focus on yourself and focusing on God are opposite principles that cannot operate at the same time. Let me say that again. Focusing on yourself and focusing on God are opposite principles and stand antagonistic in opposition to one another, cannot operate at the same time. It says the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God. What law? In context, it's talking about the law of love. The law of God spoken here is the law of love. A mindset set upon self cannot be submitted or fulfill God's love. It's selfish. A flesh mindset will only give if it's an advantageous to self and makes self look good or for the advantage of self. If what is given, though, is spurned or not received, then their love turns quickly to hatred and bitterness. Let me tell you something. There is a very thin veil between the world's love and the world's hatred. A very thin veil. Example in the Old Testament, there was a young man named Amnon. And he fell in love with his stepsister Tamar. And he got lovesick. I love you, Tamar. And all I could think about is Tamar. Oh, she's so pretty. I love her. I love her. And he wouldn't eat and he got depressed. And they said, well, what, why are you so depressed? Well, because I love her so much. And they said, well, you know the king's kid, why don't you ask your dad, act like you're sick, and ask your dad, to, to, that your stepsister Tamar can come in and make you, make you pizza right there, in, right there in front of them. Bake you some cakes and make you some pizza right there. And I was like, oh, that's good. So he acted sick, got the sniffles, asked his dad, can Tamar come make me some pizza? Tamar comes in and he forces himself upon her. And it says that he hated her greater than he loved her after he abused her. When you're carnal, you cannot walk in love. When you have your eyes on yourself, you can't walk in love. Neither indeed can it be. It's impossible for someone focused on self to walk in God's love. Verse 8. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. It didn't say those who are in the flesh, it's hard to please God. It says those who are in the flesh or have your mind set on yourself or set your mind set on the natural things of the earth, it says that it, you cannot, say cannot, cannot, please God. Raise your hand if you want to please God. Now, you're accepted by God 100% of the time, but you're not always pleasing to God. Uh-oh, I lost some of you. Raise your hand if you're parents. Do you accept your children 100% of the time? but are you always pleased with what they do? There you go. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Well, raise your hand if you want to please God. Well, good question. How do you please God? Look at Hebrews 11, look at verse 6. Hebrews 11, look at verse 6. It says, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So if you want to please God, what must you walk in? 
faith. Faith pleases God. So this verse talks that when, you're, when you are carnal, when you have a carnal mindset and you're, you're focused on yourself and on the natural, when you're in that, that state of mind, you cannot please God. What does that mean? You cannot walk in faith. You can't focus on the natural realm and focus on your natural self and walk in faith at the same time. You can't do it. To walk in faith, you have to walk according to the Spirit. You have to set your mind on what's true in the Spirit realm. Walking by faith and not by sight. If, you, if you're just walk by, by your natural eyes, there would be no need to walk in faith. You need, to, you need to walk by a different set of eyes than the ones that are looking at me right now. You need to go by the eyes of your heart and by what you see by revelation in the Word of God. Because if you are walking by what your physical eyes see, that's all you're going to get. And tell someone you need more than that. A whole lot more than that. <coughs> Hallelujah. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So to walk in the spirit, you must walk by faith. You cannot detect what's true in the spirit by your natural senses. You cannot look at the natural and tell what's true of you in the spirit. It pleases God when you take him, by, take him at his word that you're righteous, holy, pure, forgiven, loved, and filled with the power and love of God and what's true in your born-again spirit. See, to walk, in, to walk in the spirit, you have to tap into what's true in your spirit. And to have to do that, you have to have revelation. Look at Philemon or filet mignon, either way. <laughs> Philemon, look at verse 6. Well, give me a chapter, Pastor. There, yes, verse 6. <coughs> Philemon, verse 6. How, raise your hand if you want your faith to be effective. This is how you do it. Philemon, that's next to Titus. That's where your pages are white. It's white. You go, or you have to peel it apart. It says that your faith will become effective through the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. In the kingdom of God, before you can tap into something, you have to first acknowledge it. I can't acknowledge somebody in this room I have not uh, detected or see. If, the, if President Trump came into this room, I could not acknowledge him unless I knew and saw that he was here. So the only way you're going to acknowledge something is you're going to have to know it's present. Well, how do you know something's present in your spirit if you can't see your spirit? By revelation to the word of God. And then you can verbally acknowledge it, that it's there. And when you do that, you can tap into it and your faith becomes effective. Tell someone, your faith needs to be effective. But it can't be if your eyes are on yourself or on the natural and focusing on the facts of life. You can't walk in the spirit and be focused on the facts of life. Or you can focus on the facts of God's life. Verse 9. <clears throat> but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. It says, but you're not in the flesh. Have you ever heard someone say, well, you're just in the flesh? Actually, that's not true. If you're born again, you are not in the flesh and never are in the flesh. Well, that's good news. Now, you can have a flesh flash or a flesh season. 
you can walk according to the flesh, but not be in the flesh. In the flesh and in the spirit is, were, is terms of position. If you're in the spirit, that means you're born again. And you're connected to the life of God and your spirit's alive and you're connected to the Holy Spirit. You're in the spirit. So tell someone you're in the spirit. Because I'm, I'm thinking this is all family here. You're all born again. Or you're putting up a good show. Hallelujah. You're in the spirit. Even though you walk according to the flesh. Or you're, if you're an unbeliever, you're in the flesh. All unbelievers right now are in the flesh. And walk according to the flesh. This verse says... But you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Raise your hand if the Spirit of God dwells in you. Then you know you're in the Spirit. You're in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. A believer is always in the Spirit, although a believer may not always walk according to the Spirit. A believer can walk after or according to the flesh or according to the spirit. An unbeliever can only walk according to this flesh. Now for born again, we are born again by the spirit and sealed by the spirit. So we're in the spirit at all times. Who we are in the spirit determines our identity. If you're born again, you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. If you're an unbeliever, you are a sinner. Living by faith in who and what we are in the Spirit will cause us to bear fruit and be stable Christians. It says, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, not everyone has the Spirit of God in them. What makes a Christian different than an unbeliever is the Spirit of God dwells in them. As a believer, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You house the Holy Spirit. Some temples are larger than others. Hallelujah, I like to give the Holy Spirit a little bit more space to work. <sighs> it must be fuzzy head, I'm sorry. A Christian has been joined to the Lord in his one spirit with him, 1 Corinthians 6, 17. This is how a Christian is to bear fruit from the root of God's spirit on the inside, the root of the life of Christ on the inside. We bear love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And this is in any environment. Positive, negative, peaceful, hostile, it doesn't matter. That's what makes Christianity supernatural. Is that no matter what, where a Christian's dropped, if they're walking in the Spirit and walking by faith... They will bear fruit, the same fruit, no matter what environment they're put in. And oftentimes, the worse the environment, the better the life of Jesus is seen. The darker it gets, the more light will reveal itself. You might be a dim little light bulb. But if it's completely dark, you show up. There's hope for you, little light bulb. <laughs> Might not be the brightest bulb in the box. <laughs> but shine for Jesus. <laughs> We're billboards for God. People say, how can you be joyful? You have the same boss I have. Why can you be in such peace? Because you're in the same environment, living in the same chaos everybody else is. Because you're bearing supernatural fruit. And they say, what is it about you? Let me tell you about Jesus. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. If, you, if someone does not have the Holy Spirit living within them, they don't belong to Jesus. Why do I stress this? Because there's a false teaching today called universalism. 
which teaches Jesus died for everyone, so automatically everyone's saved and reconciled to God, although many don't know it. That they belong to God, they just don't know it. And to actually enjoy the natural benefits, you have to be born again. To, to, to be healed and to prosper in life, you need to know about it, know the program, actually get in on it, get born again to where you can actually participate in this life of the benefits of salvation. But even if you don't, you still belong to God and you're still reconciled to God and you're going to heaven one day. <laughs> What's this verse say? This verse says that if you do not have the Spirit of Christ or the Spirit of God, you are none of His. Let the Bible stand in the way of what you believe. Verse 10. And if Christ is in you, that means you're born again, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. Let's look at this. <clears throat> the body is dead because of sin. What's that mean? Death is working in our physical bodies because of the sin principle that's within your members. Guys, that's why one day you're going to physically die if Jesus does not come back. Everyone. It's 100% mortality rate. You're all on death row. Boy, I came to church to get some good news. <laughs> well, let's focus on the second half of the verse. But your spirit is alive because of righteousness. Now that, you see that, do you see the, the big S? The, the spirit is life. You actually have to see the context. Is, is it speaking of when the word spirit used, pneuma? Is it the Holy Spirit or your spirit? And in context, he's contrasting your flesh and your spirit. Flesh and your spirit. This should be little s. This is your spirit. Your spirit that's born again is alive because of righteousness. Who you are is who you are in the spirit. You live in a body. Your body, physical body, is dying. You're going to get a resurrected body that will never die. What, you're, what you got going on right now is not as good as it's going to get. Hallelujah. You're going to be able to walk through walls. You're going to be able to eat and not gain weight. Hallelujah. Travel at the speed of thought. I'll race you across the Pleiades. Whoever thinks quickest will get there. If Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin but the spirit is alive because of righteousness. Verse 11, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Well, pastor, that's a hope of the resurrection one day. That one day I'm going to get a resurrection body. Hallelujah. Yes, that's true. But in context, that's not what this verse is talking about. This verse is talking about that right now you can tap into a higher law, the law of life that's in your spirit, the law of life in Christ Jesus. You can tap into that and that law can impact your physical body and quicken it and empower it Amen. to live holy, to manifest Jesus. Well, pastor, I'd love to figure out how that works. Set your mind. Can you pop up the light switch? Set your mind on things above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. And I can't explain it, but when you focus on Christ in the spirit, through the word of God, life flows through him, up through your spirit, into your soul, and it dominates your body. You want to be that guy? Amen. Amen. Pastor, it has to be harder than that. It's got to be more complicated than that. I want steps.
Step number one, look at Jesus. Step number two, keep looking at Jesus. Step number three, keep on looking at Jesus. It's that simple. Keep your light switch turned on. And you can have the resurrection power of Christ impact you in your physical body. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 4. Look at 10 through, uh, verse 10 and 11. 2 Corinthians 4, look at verse 10 and 11. Paul says, always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Verse 11. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus might be manifested in our mortal flesh. When you keep your eyes on Jesus, the cross is applied to your flesh and the life of Jesus is manifested in your mortal body. It's something done in you, not by you, by your willpower. Verse 12, Romans 8, 12 says, <clears throat> Therefore, well, what's therefore? What I just said. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors. Not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. That's kind of a clunky way of saying something there. It's saying we are debtors, not to the flesh. We are debtors. What are we a debtor to? To give the gospel to people around us? Do we owe God for his salvation and we got to owe him and the rest of eternity is paying God off? No. <clears throat> We're not debtors to God. We're debtors to people to give them the same gospel we got. Paul said in Romans 1, I'm a debtor to the Jew and to the Gentile. Therefore, brethren, we're debtors not to live, to not, not, but I'm not a debtor to the flesh. You know, as a Christian, you don't have to sin. Oh, I just have to sin, pastor. It's too strong. If you're living by willpower, yes, you're right. You have to. You'll, you'll end up overcome. Now, at any given time, you can hold out. And I'm talking about the area of your weakness. There's areas in your flesh that you're strong in, that you're not tempted in. I am not tempted to get pregnant. <laughs> I'm strong. I can hold out. In the area, every one of you have one thing you lack, like the rich young ruler. There's one area that you can't ever overcome but the power of God. And it's left in you, that one thing at least. You're not a debtor to, to yield to that weakness in your life because you have the power of another you can tap into. It's your choice. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, but verse 13, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Well, I thought I was already going to die. But you can die earlier. You know, there's certain things you can do to cause you to live shorter than you would have lived. Well, where's that in the word? Proverbs. Proverbs is full of things. If you do this, you lengthen your days. You do certain things, you shorten your days. If you would love life and see good days, then you refrain your tongue from evil. So there's certain things you can do. Living in sin is hazardous to your health. It can put you in the grave sooner than you should have. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. I know, Pastor, I'm trying to crucify, crucify myself. I kill, I'm trying to kill myself. 
you carnal thing. Does this verse say that you are to put to, put to death the deeds of your body? It does, Pastor, right here. It says, you put to death the deeds of your body. But you, you missed out on something. You left God out of it. What does it say? But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body. Yeah, you're involved. You have a part to play. But it's not by you. It's done in you by the Spirit of the living God. And how's that done? Flip your switch. And when you focus on Christ and focus on what's true in the Spirit, Life flows from him through your spirit, up through your spirit, and it will dominate your body. Lastly, let's try to get practical. Let's put the cookies on the bottom shelf. Let's put shoe leather to our theology. So what? How do I practically live this way, Pastor? Because it's, very ch- it's an easy process, but it's challenging. You won't know how carnal you are until you start disciplining your mind to set it on the things of the Spirit. You'll find out just how carnal you've been. Well, Pastor, I want to I move in this direction, but first of all, let me tell you the worst way is to try to do it yourself. Carnal. Well, I'm going to control my mind. You need to invite the Holy Spirit to help you. Tell someone next to you, you need help. (laughs) Tell tell the other person next to you, you really need help. (laughs) Invite the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, when my mind's off, remind me, help me get it on, show me the things in the Spirit. Help me, Holy Spirit. Four things that you can practice, the Holy Spirit will help you develop a discipline in as a disciple that's called discipline that will force your mind to think on the things of the Spirit. Practically, number one, meditate the Word. Meditate the Word. 2 Corinthians 3.18, but we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of the Lord. As in a mirror, look at the glory of the Lord. The mirror is the Word. Look in the Word to what's true in the Spirit. Don't look at the Word to see what's true about you in the natural. Now, it may show you what what you're doing in the natural, but get your eyes off that and see who you are in the Spirit. And the, and the only way you can do that to see who you are in the Spirit is look at who Jesus is. As He is, so am I in this present world. <clears throat> John 6.63 6, says, It is the Spirit who gives life, and the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. The Word of God is the only way you can tell what's true in the spirit realm. It's the only approved Method by any time at any moment you can look into the things of the Spirit and it's approved and you can do it. Psalms 1 2 says, But this delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law or word he meditates every once in a while. Oh, I'm sorry. Clueless translation. Day and night. Guys, you need to daily read the Word of God. Well, I do, Pastor. I read three chapters a day in the Word if I don't forget (laughs) or fall asleep. And then I have to read six. And I read 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 and I read. And then I get done. I said, I did it. You just made a mistake. You should read half the time. And then the other half, equal half the time, meditate on what you read. Try this this week. Ten minutes of reading. Then stop. Then think ten minutes, meditate on what you read. And invite the Holy Spirit to show you. Second discipline, prayer. Has it come to that? Has it come to this? Yes. Prayer. 
The word prayer is the Greek word prosuke, which means to beseech to the face. To beseech to the face. It's face-to-face communion with God. When you're in prayer, your focus is on God, or it should be. Unless you're like the righteous, self-righteous Pharisee who prayed with himself. Lord, I thank you that I'm not like everybody else. Prayer. Look at, sec, look at sec, we're almost done. Second Chronicles 20, look at verse 2. Have you ever had a bad day? Have you ever had a bad day? Well, have you ever had a great multitude come up against you? Well, it feels like it. I've had hordes of demons. I'm talking about hordes of demons and hordes of people. You open the blinds and there, there's the army, navy, and everything. They're all against you. Well, that happened to Jehoshaphat one day. Jump in Jehoshaphat. 2 Chronicles 20, look at verse 2. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat. There's always some with good news. I love to share the news. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you. <laughs> Called a bad day. Verse 3, And Jehoshaphat feared. Well, you would too in the natural. But he set himself to seek the Lord. Good thing. Proclaimed a fast throughout all of Judah. And then look at verse 12. The end of the prayer, God, Jehoshaphat says this to the Lord. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us. That's not wrong to admit that you don't have the power to deal with what you're facing. And then he said this. Nor do we know what to do. We don't have the power to deal with what's about what we're facing right now in the natural. And I don't even know know what to do about it. You ever been in that position? But don't stop there. What else? What did he say? But our eyes are on you. Flip the switch and open yourself up to divine wisdom. And God gives him wisdom. He says, now you're going to go out, but you're not going to fight. You're going to send out the choir. Now the people most not excited about this was the choir. (laughs) Third discipline, praise and worship. Keeps your mind set on the things of the Spirit. Because 2 Chronicles 20, they went out and did what God said in verse 16. Tomorrow go down against them, for surely they will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz. I don't know where Ziz is, but... And you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. That's where Ziz is. You You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourself. Position yourself. How do I position myself for victory? (laughs) Can you show me my guy with the light switch on? He's positioned himself. Position yourself, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them and the Lord is with you. So they rose up early in the morning, went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. You can't believe God with your eyes on your circumstances. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who would sing to the Lord and he would praise the beautiful beauty of his holiness. And they went out before the army and were saying, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. The Lord loves that ditty. Now, when they began to sing and to praise, when they began to what? The Lord set ambushes. 
I don't know what that is, but I like it. <laughs> Ambushes. Against the people of Ammon, Moab, Mount Seir, who had come up against Judah, and they were defeated. The people of Amnon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir to utterly kill and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they helped destroy one another. Till finally you had two guys left on the battlefield. And they just stared at each other. And what do we do? And they both just went, and they both fell down. They positioned themselves. Got their eyes off the natural, got their eyes on the Lord. Worship and praise will do that for you. Lastly, thanksgiving, a lifestyle of thanksgiving. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, but thanks be to God. Say, thanks be to God who gives us the victory. Raise your hand if you would like victory. What comes before it? Thanks be to God who gives the victory. 2 Corinthians 2, 14, last verse. Now, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. Raise your hand if you want to always experience triumph. What goes before it? Now thanks be to God. Now thanks be to God. Now. Say now. now. Right now. I don't care what. You haven't seen the manifestation yet. Now. Now thanks be to God. Flip your switch. Look at what's true in the spirit realm. Triumph is coming. Father, I thank you so much for the word of God. Lord, we can learn to flip our switch and to leave it on and the power of God will operate. We thank you for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's worship God. Amen. Let's stand together. And Wow, that was an encouraging message, wasn't it? Praise God. So, so as always, you know, we just want to encourage you to focus on Jesus right now. You know, whatever worries, fears, concerns you had, anything that would tempt you to look down, let, let's look up to Jesus. Amen, the author and finisher of our faith. We're going to be singing some songs that focus on God's greatness, on his goodness to us in our lives. And we're just, we're just going to come to him with humility and gratitude right now. Amen. Amen. great 
Let's, you know, as we look up, let's magnify God. Let's magnify his goodness because you know what? No matter what the situation, it always pales in comparison to him. Amen. 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 And as always, too, we've got our awesome prophetic gatekeepers over here at the side. I believe we've got Miss Barbie over here today. And, you know, if you feel like you have a, a just a message or a word to benefit the church to, to encourage the body, what we've heard today, I would encourage you to share that. Let's just, let's just keep magnifying him right now. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, all will see how great, how great is our God. And sings my soul. And then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great, how great Thou art, how great Thou art, and then sings my my Savior God to Thee. You know, church, how great. And how great Thou art. How great Thou It's your breath in our lungs, 
So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. Great are you, Lord. You give life. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore. Every heart that is broken, great are you, Lord. It's your breath. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you, oh, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you, oh, me. next part, I just want us to make this a declaration. You know, we're not going to let fear, unbelief, and doubt get in the way. We're going to proclaim God's goodness over anything. Amen? We're going to tell the devil what he can do with those problems. Let's sing all the air. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. Let's keep singing that. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. One more time, church. your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing.
Great are you, Lord, greater than my problems. And great are you, Lord, you're greater than my fears. And great are you, Lord, you're better than the problems. Great are you, Lord. Is it your breath in our lungs? So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Just keep singing. Keep lifting up that praise. take a few moments just lift up your prayer language lift up that praise to God you know the devil he can't filter that he can't un, he can't hinder that in any way so let's just lift up that thanks to God let's let praise be our weapon today amen let's let the gift of tongues let's let's use that to encourage us to look up to him today amen It's your breath in our love, so we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our love, so we pour out our praise to you only. Great. From the moment that I wake up till I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. Hallelujah. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. the goodness of God. I love your voice. You 
have led me through the fire in darkest night. You were close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my Whose who's switch is flipped? Praise God. But, but, but someone needs to make a decision today that I'm going to practice keeping it on. Now, some of you have worked on this. None of us was perfect. The only one that was perfect at this was Jesus Christ. But some of you, have, you've, you've, you're progressing. You're on the way. There's someone here that... you. You, your emotional life is not consistent. You're, you're up one day, down the next. You're in, out. Your mind is all over the place. And so I'm not asking you to go out here and control your mind. 
carnal thing. You're not your Savior. But you need to invite the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, I need your help in this. I'm asking you to help me start on this road to where I have consistency in this. See, spiritual maturity is seen in how long you can keep your mind set on the things of the Spirit. And how fast you recover yourself when it gets out of it. So this is for, for someone in this room that's saying, I'm, I'm ready to invite the Holy Spirit starting this week and I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to have the Holy Spirit to help me. But I want to be more consistent in walking in the Spirit. And that's, if that's you, the Lord's speaking to you, I want you to raise your hand. All right, Lord, I thank you for those that have their hands raised. Lord, they're not, you're not asking them to do this in the power of their strength, their own ability. And I've already, I've already cut them off from that because that's what they're about to go do. No, we invite you, Holy Spirit. Invite you, Holy Spirit, to help us. To show us when our mind, remind us when our mind's not on the things of the Spirit. And then show us those things in the Spirit and lead us and empower us to do this into a more disciplined lifestyle. And we grow in this, Holy Spirit. We thank you for doing that. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. This time we want to continue to worship the Lord with our tithes and offerings. Ushers, we please pass out the offering envelopes and I'll be back up to pray for the offering. How great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain i could not climb in desperation i turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. But Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus, you're our living hope. Seated at the right hand of the Father. Our hope is not in an outcome. Our hope is not an event. Our hope is a person that's alive. Confident expectation of the goodness of God. Thank you, Jesus. Our eyes are on you. Lord, we thank you that everything sown in this offering is holy unto you. I thank you sealed into your kingdom. And Lord, it's going to work in your kingdom, healing, deliverance, salvation, but it's also going to work back into our life. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Men get back into our bosom so we can turn around and give it again. We thank you for grace and be able to operate in this grace of giving today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's release the rose from the back to the front. Let's, uh, if you have an offering, let's put it in the box. Let's wait till everybody serve communion. We'll partake together. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross is spoken. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. It's Jesus Christ, my Yes, 
salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Let's keep singing that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. And out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Let's sing it again. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Cause Jesus yours is the Corinthians 11 chapter 20 chapter 11 verse 23 it says for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you so we have it this morning and we're delivering it to ourselves in remembrance of the Lord the Lord Jesus Christ on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you and over in Isaiah 53, verse 5, it says what happened with his body on that cross. It says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. So when we take this bread that represents the body of Jesus Christ, think about that as we're taking this. He was wounded for our transgressions. So for our sins, every time we transgress the law, that was placed on Jesus Christ. The peace that we long to have in life and in this world and in circumstances and in our families and in our heart, in our spirit with God, that peace with God, that was put on him. All the reasons why we didn't have peace when we were unbelievers was put on him. So now we have peace. Man, that right there. In 2020 is a rare commodity for some people. <laughs> but we have been given the peace with God and the peace in our hearts. And by his stripes, we've been healed. So as we take this blood, this broken body this morning, we're receiving the healing life of Jesus Christ. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord. We have taken this bread that's been broken apart for us today. And, Lord, we receive it to ourselves, and we receive your peace we receive reconciliation with God our Father, and we receive healing life right now in Jesus' name. Let's partake together. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So this new covenant is all about what Jesus did on that cross, the fullness of that. When we take the blood, 
You know, it's interesting, too. We just got healed. We just got peace. We just got forgiveness. We just got reconciliation with God. And now he says, let me just wash you completely whole. Let me just wash you. Please know that I took it all for you on the cross. And when we take this blood, it's just like this juice represents his blood that washed us and cleansed us. And no longer do we have to have a mind that's filled with guilt, condemnation, and shame. So, Father, we just thank you for this blood. Thank you that it is from the holy, pure, undefiled Jesus Christ and his blood that sets us free, that cleanses us, that washes our mind, that causes us to keep our light switch on and focused on the Lord Jesus Christ at all times. And we celebrate that right now. We thank you for it, Lord. Thanks be to God. And thank you for the triumph that we live in this life now. In Jesus' name, amen. I think it's interesting to bring out, said, in the night, in the night Jesus was betrayed. Look at, everybody want to look, up, look at me. It says, in the night Jesus was betrayed. Holy Spirit doesn't put things in there for no reason. In the night Jesus was betrayed, he had communion. You know, if, if I was being betrayed, I might not have been willing to go to the cross. But the night Jesus was betrayed, he said... I'm still going to go to the cross. I'm going to give my body. I'm going to give my blood. I'm going to release forgiveness. Someone here today, you need to release forgiveness. You received it. You need to release it. I know you've been betrayed, but send that to the cross. Release that forgiveness today. We're all believers here, I believe. So let's just gather up in groups of four or five or six. And let's just release a blessing over each other. Let's just pray over one another and any needs that we have. Just uh, find out what those are and pray over them. And so you can be dismissed after that.